Last week, we were talking about how it's like a sin to say that you're proud of yourself. Okay. So I was wondering if, like, is it a sin to say that you're proud of someone else? That's an interesting question. I think it depends on context. Is it a sin to say you're proud of yourself? Yes. That's called tooting your own horn. You shouldn't toot your own horn. Is it a sin to say you're proud of someone? It really depends on context. If it's a two-year-old, I think saying I'm proud of you is just part of their development. Children need positive reinforcement. That's not terrible to do, as long as we don't overdo it and say we're proud of them for everything there is, and you're beautiful and you're this. We don't want to turn our children into uh, little narcissists, little, you know, egotists. But uh, I think in general, I, I wouldn't say I'm proud of you. Uh, we shouldn't be pretentious. And besides, you know, if, if you're smart, there's always somebody smarter. If you're strong, there's somebody stronger. And if you're beautiful, there's somebody beautifuler, right? <laughs> It just always is. There's, but there's always somebody that's worse off than you are too, right? So we're on a continuum. We shouldn't be so proud or ashamed necessarily of our abilities. That's even keel. Well, just an even keel. The the whole theory of the past generation of of self esteem has not has not really borne out. I mean, millennials and are like the most praised generation ever, they have probably. No self and they, yeah, <laughs> also the most. Depressed. Anxious, depressed, self-hating. So it didn't, you know. It it's work. like people know. Like if you, if somebody knows they're not very smart, and you just tell them they're smart, they 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 know it's not true. Yeah, like it when I was a kid, work. you got a first place trophy if you won in little league the championship. Mm -hmm. You got a second place if you were second, and third if you were third, and the other people got nothing. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, everybody gets a trophy. I don't agree with that. But they still know. They know. They know. They know they were in last. I don't friend. think that's the worst one. The worst one is when they give a real something that used to be a real trophy, just just like that, like mm -hmm. Nobel Prizes for peace, oh, going yeah. to <laughs> presidents that start wars. And they, yeah. for example, they just give it to anybody now. You know? yeah. It cheapens yeah. the yeah. war. Well, totally political. Not to make some political commentary, I'm not trying to, but when Obama was president, before he did anything, I mean, in his first, not even his first year of office, he won the Nobel Peace Prize. Exactly. Which is like, we're, we're giving you the Nobel Peace Prize because you're black and you're president. Mm -hmm. that, that obviously cheapens it. Yep. He was embarrassed. Even he was embarrassed. In terms of, of, of pride and saying even kill, I found that you know, true experience sort of breeds true confidence, like the kind of confidence that you actually need, like experience in life, like you're I, talking about. I agree. I agree. Experience breeds confidence and also understanding. If without experience you don't really know something. Right. Right? So if you have a little kid that you're teaching to walk, oh I'm so proud of you or whatever, sure of course. Or that's a beautiful picture, what is that? It's a whale? Oh it's a beautiful whale. Always ask. When they send you something with scribbles <laughs> and they say, here is a picture, don't say, oh that's a beautiful flower. Because they might say, that's a kitty cat. Don't do that. <laughs> Always ask. So what is that? Oh, that's a beautiful kitty cat. That's that's a secret, little secret. Okay, a little parenting tip for you, a grandparenting tip. The um, the proud thing. Do you think potentially that if you were saying that it's the millennials that are the most praised, is that maybe by design to make us this kind of uni unified? Just it doesn't even matter whether you're better or worse than anybody else because you're all like you're all just a blob. Like, which is intentionally designed to make it. You sound like a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> <laughs> I always knew that I liked something about you. <laughs> you know the difference. Do you know the difference between a conspiracy and fact? Not much. Six, Six months. months. <laughs> Six months. Well, you know, I think there's a certain there's a huge dumbing down of society, and we are trying to be the anti-dumbing down people, right? Christianity is not about being dumbed down. Christianity is about experiencing life as it really is, and reacting to it as it really is, as we really should. Um, my, my sermon was full of that today. My sermon is always full of that. That's yeah. all I. That's yeah. all I ever yeah. talk about. I mean, really. Yeah. I mean, really. I. You know, I could give a sermon. I could say, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Fulfill your purpose in life. Okay. The end. That's it. But we have to say a little more than that, don't we? So God help us. We are really in a terrible, terrible fix, aren't we? With people that are not learning how to be people, and with all the masking that's gone on, children, they don't know how to relate to people as children anymore. That they. Sh 
we've created a, this generation of basically, we've created autistic children, if you can say such a thing. I know autism is a biological, psychological uh, syndrome, but we've created autism. People that don't know how to, how to interact with one another normally. What a bizarre thing. What a bizarre thing. Well, she was saying, you know, the people being praised and that's sort of a design to maybe keep people weak and make them proud and not really go out and experience. It seems like that's, you know, the entire culture is obviously like that. So, you know, you go towards God doing the right things and it's like they've literally shifted everything 180 where everything to do is like walking away from God. So it's just every yes. possible angle is being... And we must, we must understand that we are in that toxic soup. Mm -hmm. So don't think you're immune to that. Don't think you're immune. It's very hard. As a pastor, I find that criticizing somebody, even um, some people, a lot of people, the least bit, and they shut down. Don't be that person. Be willing to take criticism. Be willing to recognize your faults. We've created a generation, two generations, three generations, of liars. They lie to themselves. They pretend they're something or they believe they're something they're not. We're not all that. We shouldn't think we're all that. We think, should think we're sinners in need of our, a Christ. And then we become powerful. But if you don't believe that, if you really think that you're sort of a little, a little czar, if you're a little king, a little queen, a little god, well, that's not the way the world really is. You know, it's funny in, in the viewing yourself, I mean, think of all the, you know, ascetics and monks and saints of the church who view themselves less than dirt, but, like, in comparison to the rest of humanity, they were, like, titans. Yes. And how they walked and how they lived, and they didn't even regard Well, that's part especially. of the reason, in my opinion, why orthodoxy is, is really not very popular. There's, in my opinion, two things, my humble opinion, two things. One is that orthodoxy is just more abundant. There's a lot of people that are orthodox that are really just not really orthodox. And including bishops, including priests, that they're not teaching as they should, they're not living as they should, they're not fasting as they should, etc. So that's one big problem. And the other problem is that what we have to work with is humans that just, they don't, they don't, there's something empty inside them about purpose and about, and about responsibility. I don't want to sound like some sort of grumpy old man, but I was raised with literally the idea that I have responsibilities and that I, I have a responsibility to people around me and that my personal integrity was absolutely paramount. That was the way I was raised by a father who wasn't a Christian, just believed in the man upstairs. But he imbued in me these, these ideas of fairness, of compassion, uh, the things he taught me about women. He taught me to protect women. What an idea now, to protect women. Not because they're weak or, or because I'm superior, but because I happen to be in a position that I can protect them. Being a man, I can protect women, and I should. I don't hear that much anymore. God help us, we have to make sure that we fight that tendency of narcissism in our society. It, our society is, I, I believe our society is more narcissistic than at any time in human history. Just something that I experienced recently, it, not judging. Even the small things, it's a big, big thing. Not judging your neighbor, not judging some, someone close to you. If, you. if you do, it will come out and it will not be the way you want it. That's my little experience. That's true, yeah. that's true. But that's why I talk to you all the time. This is a catechism class, which whether we're catechumens, officially, we're inquirers, we're being orthodox for, in my case, over 40 years. We're always learning, and, and we must really learn the, the ethos of the church, the mindset of the church, the phronema of the church. It's a very difficult word to really uh, define, more or less the mind of the church. We have to learn to think as our Lord thinks, and, and with humility, but with strength, with, with, um, with courage, and, and with integrity. And we learn that from taking our lumps and and praying as, as Orthodox Christians pray. I just heard about somebody was telling me they went over to somebody's house who recently became Orthodox and in the study was a study full of Bibles of various translations and commentaries and there was one Orthodox book in the whole study. So why did you become Orthodox? Somebody chrismated you and now you're Orthodox. Are you Orthodox? You know, Orthodoxy is to develop that mindset 
that is present in the, the way of the church, in the mind of the church. That's why I just absolutely insist that you guys read Lives of the Saints. You absolutely have to do it, because the mind of the church is in the lives of the saints. It's like the gospel played out is what's happening. You just touched on the question that I had for today as well. What's your question? So reading Lives of the Saints, and especially uh, modern mortars, uh, mortars of Russia, Maybe I didn't get to the point, but uh, when I compare that to the martyrs of the, of the early um, church, uh, then there is, there is an aspect of a miracle, like the boys in the, in, in, in the fire, mm -hmm. untouched by the fire. I'm not seeing those examples in more modern versions. Is oh, there are. I'm not, oh, there I'm, are. I'm not there are. There was a there. man... Uh, uh, Father Peter Hears is a wonderful, wonderful podcast about the new, new martyrs. It's fantastic. He goes into great detail, and there was a priest. He was beheaded and left for dead. His head grew back on, and he went back, came back to life, and he lived for another 12 years, I think. So, yeah, there are... Reattached? Or yeah, no? reattached. And there was a line that you could tell that he'd been beheaded. <coughs> So that's pretty miraculous. There were these uh, nuns of, um, can't say the word, Shamadoro or whatever. I don't, can't say the word right. But they were in a, a work camp and they refused to work. We will not work for the atheist government. You gotta work or else you don't eat. We will not work, okay? It's in the middle of the winter. We're gonna put you in the, in the box. And you've probably seen those southern movies. You get put in the box, you know, and you're, they're all sweaty, and it's just a big metal box. Well, imagine a metal box if it's freezing outside and it's minus 40 at night, or maybe minus 40 during the day. You're not going to live very long in such a box, right? It was actually a small room, but it was a metal room out in the middle of, of the camp yard. And they put them in there, and of course, they're going to freeze to death. In a couple of hours, they'll be, they'll be dead, and in a, in a day, they'd be frozen solid. Well, they come back after two days, and the women were warm. There was ice everywhere, except on them, and they were chanting. And then the people, the, the camp coming out, being an atheist, but also being like superstitious, he just let them out and just left them alone. <laughs> so when, when I read the, well, martyrs, one, one part that I'm, I'm not understanding is, okay, so the martyr was beaten badly, tortured, and restored, and then still beheaded and, and died. So what's the lesson in, in that final part? So, so God takes on showing, showing the power and restoring that, that beaten up man or woman, uh, growing the, the, I don't know, legs or, or, or arms, but still, but that person still gets killed, gets, gets beheaded in the end. Well, and that's what the person would desire. I mean, yeah. at that point, they, they want to be in the kingdom. They want to be done with it. They, they, after all, they've had, their limbs have been severed or they've been, they're, they're half dead. And they want to be all the way dead so they can be all the way alive. So, you know, if you're going to be martyred that far, if you're going to be tortured that far, it's like, please finish. Because I, I want to go to be with my Savior. That's what I would be thinking. So, so basically, it's well, more of a choice of, of, that, of that martyr to, <coughs> I paid my price and I, and I, I, I don't want to continue living here, right? Well, I, I think that's part of it. That's part of it. I mean, there are stories in Lives of the Saints where the, the, the executioner would be nervous and he would say, I, I pray for him and say, you know, and give him some money or something and say, you know, you can do this. Come on. <laughs> you know, all you'd have to swing. <laughs> You know, and or, or swing and miss a little bit, and then they would they would coach them. That's how I've read that in Lives of the Saints. I think that the major thing that I glean from the Lives of the Saints and the Martyrs is their courage and their understanding the reality that I don't see. Right? I know that God is here. I know that God's light is here, but I don't see it. I, I know there's a next life that is beyond anything we can imagine here, but I don't see that life. And I think that when they were being martyred, they experienced a fuller knowledge of that life. And it made them impregnable. Not biologically impregnable. I mean, you swing an ax at somebody's head, it comes off. Unless God intervenes. Well, think about St. Stephen, when he was getting stoned, the heavens opened up before him. Right. You can only imagine what he was seeing. 
where right. we saw the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Father, or standing rather. So I don't think that the, the way they were martyred is so much something that we should focus on, because sometimes it's, it's amazing the things that they endured, and some of them were cured multiple times, etc. What we should look to is, is their incredible zeal, their bravery, uh, maybe their cowardice and then their bravery, maybe some, some change that occurred in them, things like that are what I look to in the lives of the martyrs. And I think it's realistic to say that sometimes maybe there have been embellishments about some of the stuff, but not about the core personality, I don't think. That's what I glean from the lives of the martyrs, especially, is, is there, they, they saw reality. And you and I, we talk about reality. <laughs> Do we see it? Well, evidently not, because we're still doing stupid stuff. <laughs> if, we, if we knew, really, <laughs> The truth about matters, would we sin? I don't think so. So we're, we're looking through the glass darkly right now. And I don't think they're looking through the glass darkly when they were being martyred. So I think the glass was very clear. So would, would actually knowing not be the end of believing? Because once you know, you know. Uh, belief is something you don't know, right? Okay, in that context. But when we say our belief, it's really our knowledge, our this is true. Mm -hmm. It's like, I believe that if you throw a ball in the air, it will fall back to the earth. Well, I actually know that, right? Because of gravity. I know that it's going to happen. That's the way we use the word believe. But if we use it in a colloquial way, I believe this will happen, well, then there's some doubt with us. And I think with all of us, if we're honest, there is a certain amount of doubt because of fear of, because we're flesh. I mean, would we be willing to jump into the fire? I know that there's a story, I don't remember, it was just recently, of a child. She, her mother was being thrown into the flames, and the king was, or not the king, but the, you know, the, just the political dude who was just torturing them. The child was very beautiful, I think three years old, and putting the child on his knee and, and kind of being sweet and kind to him, and he squirmed away from him, and he, I think they wanted, uh, what do you want? I want to be with my, I want to be with my mother. I want to be in the kingdom, right? At three years old. And he's holding him and no, he wants to keep him. And he squirmed out of his grasp and ran into the fire. Can you imagine three years old running into the fire? To be with his mother, to be, to be saved. I mean, that's amazing belief. That's something that we can't comprehend, that we can't understand. It might happen to you or me. It might happen that we have that kind of courage at that moment. But I think it's a mistake to say, that, oh, the lives of the Russian martyrs or the Bulgarian martyrs or the Romanian martyrs, the Serbian martyrs, there's so many martyrs. There's more martyrs in the past century than there were all the other centuries combined by a large amount, probably in order of magnitude, that some of these were not so miraculous. I think it's miraculous when a soul has courage. And there are definitely miraculous things that happen in, in the martyrs of Russia and Romania, et cetera, et cetera. There definitely were miracles. But I think the vast majority of the martyrs, even if you read like a book like this one, this uh, Synarch, sorry, it might mention, you know, I don't know, St. Uh, Sebastian and the uh, 2,000 martyred with him. Well, it might, it mentions parenthetically, you know, Sebastian da, 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 or whatever, and then 2,000 were put to the sword. Well, they were put to the sword. The soldier goes to the sky, stabs him, he's dead. Stabs him, he's dead. Beheads him, he's dead. No miracle, dead. But they're all in eternity with Christ. So I think of the vast amount of mar martyrs, when they were thrown in the fire, they burned. Up. When they were stabbed, they died. When they were hit with an axe, they were beheaded. But in some cases, God intervened just for reasons that only he knows. <laughs> Perhaps maybe for this, for the salvation of the those <coughs> around them, the, the people around them. Many yeah. times, the people around them. There are many stories where you have someone being martyred, and one of the executioners or the guards or, or a scribe sees it and says, "I too am a Christian" or something, and then they're martyred as well. And often they're martyred by immediately being beheaded. So. Well, there are examples too. Like, wasn't Saint John? Like, they tried to kill Saint John, the, the the theologian. They tried to kill him multiple times, and 
It's just the dip in oil, and it wouldn't work. I think, I think that's true. Um, boiling out of oil in front of everybody. And that's how he ended up exiled, because they couldn't kill him. But the majority of people... But that was because he had a special work. He had some work to do. Yes. The majority of people that get dipped in hot oil die. But occasionally somebody does. Yeah, that's how that goes. <laughs> <That's how that's laughs> <how that's> <laughs> Dipping a person in hot oil, am I going to die? Yeah. But maybe God would, for some reason, not have a person. Maybe he'll make you not. You know, feel make, it could. Your flesh I, melting off. I, you know, I don't know. Some martyrs didn't feel, and some martyrs did, and that might be frightening. But you know, when we're when the grace of God covers a man, a woman, a child, things happen <coughs> that are beyond our ken. Reminds me of the ascension of Isaiah. I don't know if, how well the church synced to this, but the tradition is he got sawed in half, and he didn't make a sound. Mm -hmm. You know, while they were sawing him in half. I think it's like one of those like two man saws. Like, yeah, I think it's very possible. I think it's very possible. So, read the lives of the saints. Also, not just for the martyrs, but also just to see how people live a Christian way of life. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to become human beings, and truly human beings, as Christ is a human being. And the lives of the saints are the gospel played out. So definitely read the lives of the saints. So why don't I sing you to John the Merciful? There's also a filler at the Merciful. John the Merciful on the 12th of November. He was uh, born of an illustrious family, and he married and had several children. Then the children died, because in that day, you know, this was in the 7th century. Children died of diseases. His wife died, maybe in childbirth, maybe of disease. So he was left widowed. And he decided, well, that must mean I should free myself from worldly care. And he put himself into the hands of God. He was consecrated as Patriarch of Alexandria eventually. And he gathered all everybody in the, in the metropolis of Egypt. And it, this is Alexandria. And he told his clergy and you know his deacons and such to make a registration of his masters, he called them. He called his masters. All the poor, all the homeless, all the beggars. This is an society now that if you're a poor or a beggar, lots of luck. It, there wasn't this concept really of, you know, we just certainly didn't have government intervention for them. The government didn't help. The church did. The church had hostels and hospitals and feed, fed the poor and stuff. But a lot of the poor, to be a poor person then was to be really, really poor. What he did is made them register everybody. There were over 7,500 indigent people. And he, were commanded, he commanded that they were to be fed every day and given the clothes they needed. This was pretty revolutionary. It wasn't normally done. He would often say to God in his prayer, We shall soon see, Lord, which of us two will win this contest. Thou whoever givest me good gifts, or I who will never cease distributing them to the poor. Can you imagine? This is really a supernatural way of living. Absolutely super way, natural way of living. So... He was known for distributing alms to everybody. So here he is going somewhere, and people would follow him. And people would ask for alms. You can see that sometimes outside of churches in Russia. You could see 100 people with little alms boxes. And they would ask for alms. I saw that when I was there. And so he didn't make a distinction between good and bad. So there was a man who came, and he gave him some money. And then the man ran ahead, I guess, and made a disguise <laughs> and asked for more money. This happened three times. And it was the same man. He wasn't disguised very much. He probably wrapped something around himself or whatever, or looked away or something. It was obvious it was the same man. Yeah, dead glasses, you know. With the nose big, on it. Big old glasses. <laughs> <nose. laughs> yeah. And his deacon noticed that and was telling him that, but he basically said, well, maybe, maybe my Savior Jesus has come on purpose to put me to the test. So he kept giving him money. What would we do? We'd say, that guy, he's dishonest. He's, you know, don't get away from here. But he didn't do that. I find that to be pretty amazing. I'm not saying we should always apply that in every circumstance to, to people. I'm not saying that, you know, if you see a guy that's a drug dealer down the street and he's saying, I need money for food, and, and you it really looks like he's going to go to the drug deal. Don't give him money. Go give him a sandwich. But 
this is an amazing state of mind to think it might have been an angel, it might have been Christ. So he, at the last time when he was told, he told the deacon to give him twice as much, <laughs> twice as much money. So that's pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. And then there was two days a week that he would station himself at the church door and he would be waiting for them. People would come and ask him to settle disputes. And he just was well known for never criticizing, always having wisdom and always bringing the best out of people. I think that's an amazing life, an amazing life. And he had this way, he was very kind, but he wasn't a pushover. So there were some Monophysite heretics around. He told his clergy, do not commune them. Don't commune the Monophysite heretics. So he wasn't just saying, everybody's beautiful. We're just going to be inclusive here. We're just going to love, love, love. Yeah, but we're not going to be against the truth. To, to, that, uh, to that statement, so you, you know who Klaus Schwab is, right? Yeah, barely. Like Klaus Schwab. So he's getting more and more known. <laughs> Worldwide, yeah, he's, so he's part of the Antichrist it, preparation. Yes, yeah. but is he a neighbor? We should he's one of the, one of the ones. How? How? how <laughs> what, what, what's the what? What's the stance? What's the relationship between? Well, yeah, you should. You should care for Klaus Schwab's <coughs> soul. Absolutely, you should pray for him. So should you pray for Beyonce and Jay Z? Sure, why not? Yeah. Of course. And Joe Biden. Of course. Well, yeah, you're supposed to. Be perfect. Perfect. Of course. So of course. Of well, we course. pray for our enemies. Yeah. We pray for our enemies. <coughs> so you can't, in some sense, you can't pray for your enemies. You have to acknowledge them as your enemies. I'm not really so sure it would be wise to say Joe Biden is your enemy. I think it would be better to say that Joe Biden has got uh, one foot in the grave and one foot on the banana peel. Mm -hmm. He's almost 80 years old. Oh, yeah. He's clearly has dementia, <laughs> and he's going to meet his that's maker. But, but that, that's, that's, the right, that's, right. that's a terrifying yeah. thought yes. for anyone. Yes, it is, but to, 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 to your statement, so we pray for the enemies and we love neighbors. And how, how do you reconcile the two, right, I guess? How do you reconcile? Yeah. I, well, I don't think there's anything to reconcile. I think we pray for everyone. And you pray for your enemies. Right, but again, there, there are several prayers for different, different ways we pray for, for the family, for the people we right. love, we pray for the enemies, but they're still in the enemy bucket, right? No? I guess they're in our enemy bucket. I, I don't think I would go and say, oh, I'm in town. I mean, whatever, where is he, in Antwerp or wherever he goes. I'm just going to go look in and knock on the door and say, hey, Klaus, would you like to have coffee? I don't think I want to do that. I don't want his security to even know what my face looks like. <laughs> I'm not stupid, but if you want to pray for Klaus Schropp, go ahead. I have this weird thing with celebrities where I almost dehumanize them in my mind because I always wonder how far gone they are in whatever they're involved with. And I know that's not right. That's a, that's a bad way to look at it. That's yeah. a bad way to look at it. I don't want to do that. There ain't no between a celebrity and you and me. They're made in the image of God. They need God. <laughs> There's no difference. Yeah. There's no substantive difference between us and Beyonce. So, so no one is so far gone that you lose. The they, 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 they lose paths the path to salvation. I think there are people that are so far gone that they lose the path to salvation. But I think it's not for us to know who it is, unless a person has incredible gifts given by God. But that's after living a serious life. A person might know, but otherwise, no, I don't believe anybody's beyond redemption. I don't know who's beyond redemption. I do think people do go to the point where they're like Pharaoh, and God hardens the heart, meaning he says, okay, you want to be what you want to be? All right. That's what it means, to harden the heart of Pharaoh. And I think there are people that go that far, but there are also people that have done terrible things and have come to salvation. So who are we to say? Who are we to say that we're less terrible than, I don't know, Stalin? Why am I less terrible than Stalin? Would it be correct, Father, to say <clears throat> there's nobody that can't repent? Everyone can repent, but not everyone will. Some um, people will I think, not repent, I think but the they scriptures, can. I think the scripture is clear to a certain extent. At a certain point, 
a person becomes incapable of repentance. Mm -hmm. And when that happens is a, is a point that only God knows. Only God knows. That they become incapable of repentance. And let's not get there. Because that's a, a true, that's a lost soul. I think that can happen. I think that's rare, but I think it can happen. It seems like the evidence is there from the scripture that that can happen. All right. Let's not get there. So, so I, I guess I guess where I'm struggling is it's I, I see it possible to pray for the enemy and really uh, say they don't know what they're doing, right? When you do something bad, I, I get it. Sometimes you're so delusional, or you think you're right when you're wrong, and uh, you do you do wrong things. But I, I, what I struggle is there are people that I think they know what they're doing. So, yes, there are people that know what they're doing, and and. God save them. There are people that do horrific, horrendous things. But are they, are they worse than us? I mean, we have the gospel. We have Christ in our heart. And we, yet we still judge people. I mean, let's bring it home. I, I'm not concerned about the mass murderers of the world. I'm concerned about me, that I don't have murder in my heart. And according to the scriptures, according to the Sermon on the Mount, Murder on your, in your heart is to call your brother Raka, which is basically thou fool or empty-headed. Murder in your heart is to judge your brother and to have indifference to your brother. That's murder. <laughs> that's pretty bad. So that's what I'm more concerned about. And you know, some of the great fathers, some of them would pray for Stalin or for, for Hitler or for uh, Genghis Khan. Okay, God allows that. God is happy with that. I once heard of a monk who he was praying for all these different people. And then he wanted to pray for the devil, and the Lord said, no. No, don't pray for the devil. The devil will not repent. Don't pray for the devil. And so Paisius had that experience, too. He was praying for the devil, and uh, that he would repent. And there was a dog that was near him with his tongue hanging out, just kind of looking at him, right? And he realized that that was the devil. Who was basically, did the dog change? No, he's still like, uh, with his tongue hanging out, he's not going to change. So don't pray for the devil. If you want to pray for anybody else, you pray for them. If you want to. And some people are moved in that way, to pray for those sorts of people. You know, some people are moved to pray for suicides, for instance. I pray for about 50 of them every day, by name, the ones that I, I know of. Or the people have given me their names. I get new ones all the time, unfortunately. It's good to pray for them, just because of love. Perhaps some of them will be saved. Any other questions? Well, it, sort of in that vein, Father, about loving your enemies, that doesn't mean, and sort of turning the other cheek, it doesn't mean you allow yourself to be abused. It doesn't mean you put yourself in situations, you know, like Klaus Schwab, you know, go have, you know, dinner with him and... <clears throat> yeah, I, guess, I suppose. I mean, there are times when, out of love for enemies, people allow themselves to be abused. Yeah. And I, I wouldn't say one size fits all for every circumstance and every person. Uh, you know, we also have responsibilities to those around us. Mm -hmm. I have responsibilities because some people to use that to, to, you know, to, to, to justify, like, complete pacifism and no. say... We shouldn't defend the you know, children. No, we're not. Pa Christians are not pacifists in, in any uh, idea. I mean, we might take up arms because of, of saving people, but then again, we also are not pacifists in that we are winning the kingdom of heaven by violence, are we? So we're making active choices. If you want to submit to somebody, it better be an active choice, not just by default. We don't just by default allow things to happen to us. We choose to allow things to happen to us or to resist those things. And we don't just let it happen by default. Pacifism seems completely incongruous with having a whole group of military saints, right? <laughs> yes. We're not pacifists. I mean, we're not wanting to go out and kill people, but I mean, we're not pacifists in that we actively make choices. If you want to submit to somebody, if you're, if you're submitting to somebody, if you're allowing something to happen to yourself, it should be your choice, not just that you allow it to happen because of indifference or because of fear. Make your choices. If you want to choose to resist, choose to resist, but it better be the right choice. We have to make choices in this world. It's very important. We're not pacifists. 
we're not, uh, we're not afraid, or we shouldn't be afraid. So let me talk to you about Psalm 6. O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, nor chasten me in thy wrath. Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled and my soul is troubled greatly. But thou, O Lord, how long? Turn to me again, O Lord, deliver my soul. Save me for thy mercy's sake. Who do you think is talking here? Christ. Christ. It's a messianic psalm. But it's also you who could be talking, right? Have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am weak. How is the Lord weak? How is he weak? Is it a blasphemy to say that the Lord was weak? In the flesh. No, he was human nature. What happens to human nature when you put it up on the cross? It dies. It dies. Exactly. That's pretty weak, isn't it? When you scourge a person. So they thought anyway. Well, yeah. he was strong and he was weak. Yes. In his human nature, he was weak. Absolutely. Well, and, as you just said, he allowed it. And he allowed it. And he made a through. choice. He made a choice. He made a choice to allow himself to be arrested and scourged. I mean, he had to basically say to the people, is this the Christ? I am he. And they all fall back, right? I think that's in John's account. They all fall back. And he's basically, come on, would you come and rest me? You know, I'm he. But let these go. So here they are with swords and staves and everything else. And they're afraid. And he's saying, he's the one being arrested. And all Peter has is one measly little sword. And everybody else is unarmed. And they're afraid. And he said, let these go. He had no authority to do that in terms of worldly authority. They had all the guns, right? But they were afraid, so he basically arranged everything. You're going to take me, let these go. And then he was, of course, the kangaroo court and everything happened. He, everything was according to his will. Well, there were other times where the crowd tried to seize him and it wasn't time yet, so he and it slipped, to have, slipped through there. Right, it's time. mysterious. How did that happen? He just walks right through. He walks through that. Did he become invisible? Did he teleport? Who knows what he did? But he didn't allow himself to be taken. But we can also put, personalize this prayer. This is a psalm of David. A lot of psalms were David. I thought they were all written by David, even the ones... No, there was a psalm by Jeremiah, there's a psalm by Moses, there's a psalm, psalms by the sons 73. of Kor. Uh, yeah. 73. Asaph as well, right? The 150 of Roman is known that David wrote 73, well, if not. It's known anymore. Yeah, but it, like Psalm 118 doesn't have his name as the author, but he, he had to have written that. So 73 that have his name in the title. Yeah. So at least, yeah. So the other, ones were, yeah. other ones were written by him. Pretty close to him. So he wrote this. We can personalize this. O Lord, rebuke me not in thy anger, nor chasten me in thy wrath. They have to understand about the wrath of God. The wrath of God is not like, you know, sinners in the hands of an angry God and God throwing lightning bolts like Jupiter or something. The being in the presence of God and being a sinner, that you'd feel wrath. You'd feel fear. We don't want to have that. We want to change so that we can be in the presence of God and feel like the three children in the furnace, right? In the fire, and yet it would be like a moist dew. So that's what I, I think we're, we're asking for there. We're asking, I want to change so that I will be in your presence and not feel wrath, but rather feel the, the love of God. And have mercy on me for I am weak. Which one of us wouldn't want to say that, huh? Which one of us doesn't feel weak? Heal me for my bones are troubled. My soul is troubled greatly, but thou, O Lord, how long? Do any one of you just sometimes feel impatient, like, how long? How long am I going to be like this? How long is the world going to be like this? Don't you feel that impatience? Yeah. You feel it? You feel it? Yeah. Absolutely. So that's, don't you think the Lord felt that? What, what about when the man came to him and had the boy who was a demoniac? What did he say? How long will I be with you? Oh, sinful generation, how long for it will I be with you? By the way, you can't tell it with you who translations. That you is plural. You're not talking to the man. He's talking to, to the world, talking to humanity. How long will I be with you? All y'all, if you want to say it in Texan or Southern. How long will I be with all of you? So I think a Christian should have that feeling of we are strangers in a strange land. We're wanderers, we're pilgrims. This is not our home. Our home is heaven, and we're on a journey to heaven. And we're kind of going, when will we get there? Are we home yet? Are we there? Are we there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Are we there? I think that feeling yeah. only gets more amplified the older you get, the closer to God. Yeah. Is it? The feeling is more, yes, the feeling is more amplified the closer you get to God. Turn to me again, deliver my soul, save me for thy mercy's sake. For in death there is none that is mindful of these, thee, and in Hades who shall confess thee? 
Now, the doctrine is that when a person dies right now, they go to Hades. Now, Hades is busted, but you still go. I mean, there's, or you don't go. I think the people that are, that are blessed, they don't go to Hades. The others, are they're in some intermediary state, and maybe some of them God will save. God doesn't reveal all those things to us. But for the Jew, Hades was the place of the dead. Not Gehenna. Now, Gehenna is hell. The lake of fire. The lake of fire. There, really, I don't think there is Gehenna yet. It's not happening. And, but in death there's none that is mindful of thee. That doesn't mean that people don't know of God, but they can't be with God. You know, there's a certain separation because of our inability, our incompetence. I think of it like a child that wants to get something on a shelf. Well, he's not tall enough to get up there. He can see it, but he can't get to it. I toiled in my groaning every night. I will wash my bed with tears while I water my couch. David prayed like that sometimes, especially when he was praying for his son Absalom. And we should pray like that. That's why evening prayer is actually the highest prayer. Unfortunately, I pray better in the morning. So I try to get up earlier and early in the morning when it's still dark. And so it's still evening, right? But I don't pray very well at 10 o'clock at night or 9 o'clock at night for that matter. But the great saints, they would pray all night long. Sometimes they would suspend themselves with ropes so they wouldn't fall asleep. Can you imagine standing up, suspending ropes on your armpits and praying noetic prayer all night long? I mean, how much of us are going to do that? We're going to pray noetic prayer for about five minutes and then we're going to be asleep. It won't be very noetic prayer, but we'll give it a shot. So it's good to pray at night. Now, it's also good to function during the day because you have jobs and things to do. We can't be dysfunctional. And to the extent that God assists us with our, His grace, Maybe we go with less sleep, or maybe you get up earlier. I tell people in prison, prison is just wild, and it's loud. But it's not so loud at 2 o'clock in the morning. Now, they're going to have, they're going to actually take them uh, out of bed at 3 for those who want to have breakfast. They have breakfast at 3 in the morning. It's crazy. Lunch by, they're done. Dinner's done. I mean, it's by noon. They're done with their food. I, I guess it's for the convenience of the staff. I don't know why. Maybe it's easier to handle people when they're, you know, their biorhythms are a little down. I tell people, well, what are you getting up at three when they make the noise? You should get up at two. You should be up when nobody's up. There's nobody shouting and screaming, nobody cussing. It's quiet, literally quiet, or as quiet as a prison can be. That's when you should get up and you should pray. And some of them do. Others of them, they love their sleep. When they get up and it's wild and crazy and it's very hard to pray. But it's a good idea, if you can, to get up early to pray or to stay up later to pray. And there it is. I toiled in my groaning every night. I will wash my bed with tears while I water my couch. Through wrath is mine eye become troubled. I have grown old among my enemies. That's kind of an obscure statement. But to me, I kind of interpret it this way. I'm not saying this is an absolutely ironclad, correct way to look at it, but I think that your eye is trouble. What is your eye? Your eye is the things that sees things, right? And with the eye, you desire things. And if we don't l desire correct things, we become troubled. We have to learn to train our eye and our spiritual eye to desire the things that are good, to look at the things that are good and to desire the things that are good. That's the way I've kind of interpreted it. Depart from me, all ye who work vanity, for the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. I think that probably means that you should take TikTok off your phone or whatever. Depart from me, ye who work vanity. We, if we say that prayer, but we engage ourselves in entertainments, are we really trying to be away from those who work vanity? I and mean, what's the purpose of TikTok except vanity, as far as I know? Or letting the Chinese know exactly what you're doing. So I don't have TikTok. And probably all the rest of it is on some level might be vanity. I mean, I think there's useful things. Is Instagram okay? <laughs> <laughs> there's some work that talks about Instagram. I don't remember what they're calling well, you're trying Well, you're trying to make a living, and, you know, I understand. There's a, uh, we have uh, a family group on Telegram so that we can share things, and family news and pictures and such. I don't find that to be vanity at all. It's wonderful to be able to have human communication, but those are people I know, right? Not some stranger that is, you know, whatever, like I'm not staying up all night because somebody was wrong on the internet, you know? You could be up a long time. Or watching reels. <laughs> What's that? Reels. It's, reels? Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, those are the worst because they're only like five seconds long. Oh, that's killing the brain. 
Yeah. It is killing the brain. Yeah. Basically, it's giving your brain dopamine and then making Every you completely addicted, addicted to you need more dopamine. Well, it's turning it's short all term, the normal yeah. functioning people into people like me with actual attention deficit disorder. Yeah. Where yeah. you're constantly fiending for that next dopamine hit. Well, don't do it then. You're no. ticked out. No. Okay, good. That's what he'll do to me. You know, I, I, I put out videos, right? I put out videos, sermons, and, and things. And if you watch the whole video, I think it could be very fruitful. But I see that it, it'll tell me sometimes average viewership, average view time. It's a 20 minute video, and the average view time is three and a half minutes. What did you do in three and a half minutes? I mean, I mean you what's can't the, get the whole thing. In you can't even get anything in three and a half minutes. So it's really sad that people, they want short, you know, I say you can do short things, but there's also things that have to be long. The best cure is three hour podcasts. Yeah, well. And someone yeah. talks real slow. The, the even better cure is three hour vigil. There you go. Three hour vigil yeah. is better. <laughs> a three hour vigil is even better. The than only way you can get better is three hour vigil is right way better than a three hour J Dyer podcast. <laughs> <laughs> the only way the three hour vigil gets better is if we do it five hours like the old right. Yeah. Is it? Free yeah. smart Cosmo. Oh yeah. Yeah, he can. Boy, that boy has a gift of gab, doesn't he? <laughs> he, he does. does. He does. He four does. hour podcast <laughs> with that slow. He, how can he have sound from Australia and have a draw? I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> the guy can talk so, but then when he says the Trisagian prayers, he can say them in, in three and a half seconds. Just <laughs> quick side note, it says, depart from me, all ye that work vanity, sounds so close to Matthew, when Jesus says, depart from me, all ye workers of lawlessness, or all ye that work iniquity, which is really close. It is, and I think that is uh, the context as a messianic song. Mm -hmm. However, don't you want to not be around people who work vanity? Which means you don't want to be around yourself, kind of. <laughs> We want to change to not be vain. We want to change to not look at vain things. And unfortunately, we have this society that just allows for all these things about vanity, about what this movie star is doing or saying or blah, blah, blah. We've always had it when it was possible to have it. So even the tabloids of, of Elizabethan England, and they have that kind of stuff. You know, but the before, town crier. The town crier kind of thing. But then... <laughs> You know, a thousand years ago, they weren't telling you all yeah, the a thousand years either. ago, there weren't a whole lot of Herald celebrities, and you know. You could go and to the forum and gossip. You could go to the forum and gossip, and it, but only if you live only if you lived in a large city or something. Exactly. Like if you lived in the country, you were busy just trying to be able to have enough food to survive the winter, and that's that might have been an advantage to the soul. So we want we say, depart from me, all ye who work vanity. To me, I, I personalize that, and I'm thinking. I need to not be vain. I need to. I need to not. I need to be more humble and be caring about the things of substance. I whenever it says work, uh, you work vanity. I th I think of the the Bible's definition of vanity seems to be very large because if you look at the book of Ecclesiastes, yes, there's a lot of stuff that's under the umbrella of vanity and. You know, always vain, always oh, does. So. Yeah, and the only thing Solomon says is like these things I found to be good. You know, obey, uh, keep the Lord's commandments, and take satisfaction in your toil. But all the rest of this stuff is vanity. <laughs> there you go, vanity. Yeah. I think we should judge ourselves for our vanity. Uh, there are some fathers who would say that the greatest sin is not pride but vain glory, and vain glory is a mother of actual pride. And that's, that's a technical distinction that I haven't yet understood. No matter how many times I read about it, I kind of can't work it out. I think vainglory is when we are, well, we're not giving glory to God. We want our own glory. Wasn't vainglory, a, I guess you could say, the original sin? No, it's the sin of Lucifer. Yeah, the sin of vainglory. So we're very, very, we're so, it's so prevalent in our lives. It's part of the reason why there's the hero worship of everybody, of, uh, you know, all these politicians and all these singers and all these actors and actresses and athletes and people acting crazy and extreme because there's a certain vainglory in us that wants to sort of be part of that and that's horrible you should only want to be part of christ that's it that's why you should read the lives of the saints read the psalter read the gospel seems like 90 percent of the media just fosters Slander, gossip, and vainglory, and pride in people. For sure, absolutely, absolutely. That's why you read the gospel. One of the reasons why you read the gospel, I mean, you're encountering Christ in the gospel. But what you're trying to do when you read the gospel now is you're trying to redirect and relearn how to live, 
how to be a human. So it's really, a, if you want to see it, it's like a handbook, if you want to put it in a crude way. It's a handbook for how to be a human being. So the gospel is the truth. It tells the truth about how to live and also tells the truth about how not to live. Everything in the, the gospel is true. There's no, there's no spin in the gospel. There's no falsehood in the gospel. It talks about falsehood, but it, it talks about falsehood if you have eyes to see it in a very obvious way. So the gospel teaches you what is true. That's what you, we need to learn, what is true. The world doesn't teach you what is true. It always, there's always falsehood in the world, always. And we want to have truth. That's why you read the gospel, you read the lives of the saints, you do prostrations, you read the Psalter, you might read the writings of the fathers. I would put those down the line from all those other things. Not that you shouldn't read them, but that there's so many things that you must prioritize reading. If you have more time, yes, read them. Read. If you want to read St. Maximus, you knock yourself out. But you better know the gospel really well before you be reading St. Maximus. Maybe you St. Athanasius and St. John Chrysostom first. Say nothing. Yeah, that's a good idea. So let's finish this psalm and then we'll move along. The Lord hath heard my supplication. The Lord hath received my prayer. Let all mine enemies be greatly put to shame and be troubled. Let them be turned back and speedily be greatly put to shame. In the Jewish context, they would be thinking, my enemies are the, 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 heathen. the heathen. And put to shame those heathen, put them down. Well, I think my enemies are the demons. I think my enemies are also myself, my own passions, my own vanity, my own wrong way of looking at things, my own delusional thinking. I want all that stuff to be put to shame. I want that all to be troubled and turned back, and I want to only know what is of God. So directing this psalm to yourself would be a very, very good thing to do. And what does it say? The Lord hath heard my supplication, the Lord hath received my prayer. Do you see that juxtaposition of saying, I'm a terrible person, but the God's going to hear me. There it is, right there. Right in this psalm. I'm a terrible person. I, I think terrible things. I do terrible things. And, you know, my bones are troubled and all this stuff. And yet, the Lord hath heard my supplication and the Lord hath received my prayer. Now, in the messianic context, that is Jesus Christ saying that his Father will save him, God will save him, the Trinity will save him in the messianic context. But in our context, God is going to save us. We're terrible. We are. Let's just admit it. But God loves his terrible creatures. He loves us. And he's going to help us. So we have that confidence, but also this realism about ourselves. That's only in Orthodoxy. I've never seen it anywhere else. It only gets just people dip their toe in it in other, in other Christian confessions. Or they go way overboard, and like well, Calvin. Calvin completely lost his mind, didn't he? He was, men are so terrible that God forces man to be good. No, God does not force man to be good. He's not the irresistible force that makes a person irresistibly have grace. That's just not true. Um, well, we can that, resist his grace. In that system, he forces other people to be terrible. And he forces other people to be terrible. Can you imagine? <coughs> what, an, what an idea. Okay, I'll give you one more life of a saint, and then we'll go move along. So this is about St. Martin the Merciful, the Bishop of Tours. And he was a soldier, and but he was... Christian, and there was a winter day, and he was in Gaul, very cold. That's basically modern day France, right? very cold. He met a poor man at a city gate. He was shivering because he was almost naked or had very little clothing on. He had already given alms with money. He didn't have any more money, so what did he do? He took his cloak and he cut it in two, his military cloak, and he gave it to the man, and he used the half for himself and half for the man. Their military cloak was an all-purpose garment. It was a bedroll, <laughs> it was a blanket, it was a cowl to put over them to shield them from the elements. It was a very important piece of clothing. That was the most important piece of clothing they had. Just like the Lord's tunic that was all woven in one. That was a very prized piece of clothing to have. That's why they cast lots for it. They didn't want to cut it. So he cut his cloak in two though, and then that night Christ appeared to him and he was clad in the part of the cloak that he had given away. And Martin, while still a catechumenist, clothed me in this garment, is what Christ said in the vision. So he received a baptism soon after that incident. He left the army to become, he wanted to leave the army to become a monk. Eventually he did. That was a, one of the seminal things that happened to him in his life, was the giving to the poor and giving to Christ. That can happen to any one of us. 
anybody might be Christ. It might be an angel that you're giving to. Not to, some, not, to, not to somebody that's homeless on the street. Sometimes. Sometimes that's true. Literally true. Makes you wonder if you've already like, shaken a hand, an angel's hand already. Maybe we have. Maybe we have. Let's try to get through these prayers Oof. for making of a catechumen. So these exorcism prayers to review are where we are literally exercising the devil or the influence of the devil from a person who wants to become an Orthodox Christian. We absolutely, there's nothing metaphorical about the devil. He's absolutely real. Demons are absolutely real. There's nothing metaphorical. We're not Methodists or something else that are starting to not believe in devils. There's a lot of modern day Protestants that literally don't think that the devil is real. Just it's a folk tale. The devil is very real. Now, there are a lot of folk tales regarding the devil. Like we hear one in the gospel where somebody calls this boy a lunatic. He's a lunatic because he went really nuts around the full moon. Because if the devils did that, they associated, people associated astronomical phenomena with things instead of the devil with things. That's where we get that term lunatic. Because possessed people would be especially bizarre in, in their behavior around the full moon. But if, it's not the moon that makes them crazy. It's being possessed that, that contributes to their insanity. This is the fourth prayer. Thou who art O sovereign Lord, who has created man in thine own image and likeness, and has bestowed upon them the power of life eternal, who likewise disdainest not those who have fallen away through sin, but has provided salvation for the world through the incarnation of thy Christ, sounds basically like a confession of faith, doesn't it? It's like a small creed, more or less. The sort of the important parts. God has created man in his image and likeness, which technically, it's, it's said that in a short form, but really in his image to obtain his likeness. And bestowed upon him the power of life eternal. Well, where is that power of life eternal bestowed? What's it talking about? Where does it begin? Baptism. Right? It begins with baptism and then all the rest. Of course, see, God brings us to baptism with his grace even before baptism. And who likewise disdaineth not those who have fallen away through sin, but has provided salvation for the world through the incarnation of thy Christ. Do thou thyself, delivering also this creature from the bondage of the enemy, receive him or her into thy heavenly kingdom. We recognize that the devil can put people in bondage, but that's because people are, have a predilection to things that bring them into bondage. So if a person has a predilection to some habitual sin, the devil can bring us into bondage over that sin. Absolutely. We open the door for the devil to harass us or to uh, even possess based upon our predilection to sin. So if a person is only following Christ, they can't be possessed. But then there are Christians that are not following Christ so well. Or for reasons unknown to us, they're possessed. I, I was in Russia and I heard possessed people. They would be screaming during the liturgy. Then they would bring them up for, for communion and then they would be calm. And this might go on for months or years. A person was fighting the devil within them, but they also had certain reasons why evidently the devils could take up their abode in them. And eventually a person was delivered from that. So this actually, these things do happen. But for the most part, we're not assuming that somebody who is uh, becoming a catechumen is possessed by devils, but we're all in bondage to the devils. We're in bondage to evil. We bind ourselves to evil because of our passions. What else do we pray? Open the eyes of their understanding that the light of the gospel may shine brightly in them. Yoke under their lives, or his life or her life, a radiant angel who shall deliver him or her from every snare of the adversary, from encounter with evil, from the demon of noonday, and from evil visions. Now there is eh, maybe a mini controversy. The Lord said their angels behold them in heaven. So some people say everybody's got an angel. Everybody's got a guardian angel. Muslims, atheists, pagans, everybody's got a guardian angel. Some people say that. Some people say that the guardian angel is assigned at this point. God assigns an angel to take care of a person at the point in which we say yoke unto his life. And some people will say at baptism. I don't know. I don't care. If you're baptized, you've got a guardian angel. And you should uh, pray to your guardian angel and recognize that your guardian angel helps you very much. So we're saying the demon of Dunde is a... Is a phrase from the Psalter, and so we don't want to be visited by the demon of Mune, which is kind of like this, well, you know how you sometimes you just get tired and you just get lethargic? 
I don't mean necessarily that you know after you've had food and you're. I mean that you're just lethargic spiritually. That's the demon of noonday. Sometimes it visits us. Sloth. Sloth. When I do the Jesus prayer, I get headaches. What does that sound like? Yeah. Sounds like you should keep doing the Jesus. Prayer. Oh, I keep, but uh, it's just weird. The only one I'm doing the Jesus prayer. Well, I, I mean, it's and it's my a, mouth starts hurting. It's an attack. It's an attack. So just you know, take some ibuprofen and keep doing the Jesus prayer. <laughs> Seriously. Seriously. So then, at this point, the rubric says the priest breathes on their mouth, brow, and breast. In other words, I go, make the sign of a cross. I'm blowing out in the sign of a cross over their body. I do that, and then I make the sign of a cross with my, thing, with my hand, and I do that three times. What is the breathing mean? So you know what it is? What does pneuma mean? What's the literal meaning of pneuma? Breast and spirit. And that's spirit. Pneuma and spirit. Right? Well, and Christ breathed on the apostles. Yep. God breathed into Adam. So, you know. Exactly, the breath of life. So we're, we're asking that the Holy Spirit would protect them. So expel from him every evil and impure spirit which hide it and make it his lair in his heart. And I make the sign of the cross, breathe on them, and then say the words. And I do that three times. Well, three times for the Trinity, right? Mm -hmm. We like three times. We like three and 12 and 40. I like those numbers. Seven, we like seven. Seven gifts of the Spirit, etc. So then I, the prayer goes on to mention all the things that these evil spirits can do. Um, the spirit of error, the spirit of guile, the spirit of idolatry, and of every lustful desire, the spirit of deceit and every uncleanness, which operates through the prompting of the devil, the spirit of making tons of noise. <laughs> Definitely spirited. Spirit, something spirited going on out there. Yeah. Those are very substantial spirits. They don't think, they don't look light to me. They look like very heavy spirits. And make them rational sheep in the holy flock of thy Christ, honorable members of the church, sons, daughters of thy kingdom, and heirs of thy kingdom, that having lived in accordance with thy commandments and preserved inviolate the seal, and kept their garment undefiled, they may receive the blessedness of the saints in thy kingdom. So what is the garment? Righteousness. Yes. But what is the when, when do we get the garment? Baptism. Yes. As many as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And what do we do if the garment gets dirty? We repent. We repent. Confess. Confess. Right? We wash ourselves, we fall, we down, we get back up. That's how we keep the garment undefiled. So that's the end of that prayer. The highest prayer, of course, is divine liturgy. But let's not make the mistake of saying, liturgy is the highest prayer, so I'm always gonna to go to liturgy on Sunday and nothing else. That's a really bad idea. Because if the highest form of prayer of litur is liturgy, then why don't we prepare ourselves for that prayer? And you gotta climb the mountain starting from vigil. Yeah, at climb, least. climb the mountain starting from vigil, exactly. So it's really important. And I, I, been trying to get stricter about that, tell people, you know, you've got to do something on Saturday. And if you don't come to the service on Saturday, talk to me. I work things out with people with something that's not really too hard, but at least there's something so that people have some recognition of the day.